JUICE launches to Jupiter's moons. JWST turns its gaze on the supernova remnant Cassiopeia A, and machine learning cleans up the universe, giving us a new view of a black hole's event horizon. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. For everybody asking me, when are we going to learn more about Jupiter's moons? The time begins now. The European Space Agency's JUICE mission just blasted off for the Jovian system. Now, it's just launched now, but it's going to be taking quite a while to actually arrive in the Jupiter system. It won't get there until 2031. So I hope you're patient. The plan is that it's going to make several orbits around each of Jupiter's icy moons. So Europa, Callisto and Ganymede. It's going to do some observations of Callisto and Europa, but it's really going to be focusing its efforts on Ganymede. And I'm sure you're wondering, like, I want more Europa, not Ganymede. Well, I think you're wrong. I think you want more Ganymede. Ganymede is the new Europa. And let me tell you why. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system, bigger than Titan. It, like Europa, probably has a thick icy shell. It has some kind of liquid ocean underneath, has a fairly large mantle under that. And in fact, it has an internal dynamo. So it has a moon wide magnetosphere like the Earth and like Jupiter. And so it's a really fascinating world. A lot of the same questions that will be answered at Europa will also be answered at Ganymede. Juice is equipped with a ground penetrating radar system. So it's gonna be able to map out the density and thickness of the ice, try and figure out where the water is. It also try and figure out sort of what is the size of the solid core of the moon. We'll also have a LIDAR. So it's gonna be able to map out the surface of the moon in great detail, which astronomers will then be able to study, maybe pick places for future landing sites. So I want you to sort of expand your mind and think about the Ganymedian space whales and not just the European space whales, there could be life everywhere. And our exploration of Jupiter's moons continues with juice. A new view of Cassiopeia A. There are a lot of famous supernova remnants in the night sky, like probably the most famous one is like the Crab Nebula, which anyone with a small telescope has had a chance to see. Well, another fairly famous one is called Cassiopeia A. And it's about 11,000 light years away. And when you look in a telescope, the object you're looking at is about 10 light years across. And we got new pictures of this fairly famous supernova remnant captured by JWST. And I just want to sort of explain what it is that you're looking at because it just kind of like this swirling mass of of different colors. And what happened was several thousand years ago, there was a very massive star. And as it was reaching the end phases of its life, it started to puff out its outer layers into space. And these layers sort of slowly moved away from the star getting farther and farther. And then the star died as a core collapse supernova collapsed in on itself, detonated and sent out tons and tons of material. And as this material made its way through the surrounding gas and dust that was shed before it collided and started to heat up the gas and dust. And so this picture that you're seeing is the interactions between the ancient material that was let off by the star and then the more recent collisions between the supernova energy and this gas and dust. There's much more detailed information in the underlying research and the paper and our article on it. But you can see just all of these really cool knots and streams of material as these various interactions happen. So it's a really fascinating picture, great image from JWST. Hopefully this will keep you satisfied as we wait for the next picture from this space telescope. Machine learning cleans the universe. One of the big problems with having a ground based telescope is that you're stuck underneath the stupid atmosphere, you've got this ocean of air between you and beautiful space, and it wobbles and warbles and is just gross to look through with your telescope. Anyone who has a telescope knows that the seeing above you, how clear calm is the atmosphere? How cold is it? These are all really important about whether or not you decide you're going to spend a night out with the telescope, or you just shelve it and just watch Netflix instead. 
Now, there are some technologies that can solve this problem. One of the most famous is called adaptive optics. And all you need to do is put this really complicated piston system behind your primary or secondary mirror, and then fire these really powerful lasers off into space that form artificial stars. And then you watch how these artificial stars are distorted. And then you modify the shape of your mirror to reflect that so that it clarifies the universe. If that sounds complicated and expensive, you're right, it is. And so we only see these adaptive optic systems on the biggest, most expensive telescopes. But what about smaller telescopes? So astronomers have developed an algorithm that uses machine learning to clean up the blurry pictures, the stuff seen through the atmosphere to try and recreate what is the original image that they're looking at. So what they did was they took enormous amounts of simulated data, the kind of material that's going to be generated by the Vera Rubin Observatory when it comes online in a couple of years, they were able to compare the simulated results from say Vera Rubin with a more blurry version of what you would be seeing through the atmosphere of a worse telescope. And they were able to get it to predict what the original data should be looking like. What's really cool about this is that they've released this algorithm just as open source. So any astronomer who wants to be able to try and use this to clean up their astronomical images can do so. Now, obviously, you don't want to be creating data that isn't there, you want to be accurately translating blur to better data. And that's what this algorithm is hoping to accomplish. But obviously, you know, more testing will be required. And we saw another version of this technique used in a much more dramatic way with the image of the event horizon at the heart of M87. Now you remember these really cool pictures that were taken by the event horizon telescope. We got one of the supermassive black hole in M87. We got one of the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. Both are cool. You can kind of sense its event horizonness, but obviously it's also kind of a big blurry blob. So what astronomers did was they fed in 30,000 simulations of gas rotating around a supermassive black hole and feeding into the event horizon. And then they taught this machine learning algorithm to recreate from a blurrier image to what a more precise one should probably look like. And then based on all that knowledge, they fed in the image from M87 and produced this newer version which looks amazing. Like, this is cool. This is a picture of the event horizon. Once again, we don't want to hallucinate data, we don't want to add information here that is incorrect. And so astronomers then took the rendered versions and compared it against all of the observational data that they made with the event horizon telescope to make sure that it still was correct based on the raw data that they had made. So it's a great way to do a more detailed visualization of what the event horizon telescope is seeing. And it could just take these things that are right on the edge of what you can or can't make out and turn it into something that you actually can look at and can study. Scientists create flexible mirrors. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about this idea of flat telescope lenses that you could have perfectly flat telescope lenses with they're more like electronics, and you could fly those to space, they're simpler, cheaper, thinner, lighter, all good stuff for space telescopes. And now some researchers have developed another technique that's kind of similar, making flexible mirror telescopes. So they have this technique called chemical vapor deposition, where they're able to bond reflective material onto a flexible membrane. So they put this membrane in this chamber, they bond this reflective material on top of it. Then what they do, and this is kind of a cool part, is they shape this flexible mirror into the parabolic shape that it will need to be when it's in space. You know, you don't want flat mirrors. Flat mirrors don't work, he says, discounting what he just talked about earlier. You need a parabolic mirror that's going to focus the light. And so they they create this flexible mirror, they form it into the shape, they take a temperature profile of the entire mirror. Then they flatten it back out and they roll it up. And so in theory, a much bigger version could be rolled up and put into a spacecraft and launched into space. So they launch this mirror to space, they roll it out flat, and then they're able to use these temperature changes to put it back into this parabolic shape while it's in space. And so you've got this really lightweight, 
telescope mirror that flies into space in a very durable way, rolls itself out and then forms into a parabolic shape to act like a big mirror for a space telescope. Now the version they tested so far is quite small, but they're working on a one meter version next. And so after that, we could see these fly to space and see if they work in space as well. So it's a, I love all of this technology trying to figure out ways to make lighter, more durable space telescope technology. We've been doing a lot of interviews with scientists and astronomers and astronauts, and I'm really proud of the interviews that we're doing. It really feels like we're getting a chance to go beyond just regurgitating the news and actually going out there and talking to the scientists that are doing the work. And we've got a whole playlist that you can go to that has all of the interviews that we've done. Now, when you become a patron of University Today, you support the work that we do, you help us remain independent, you help us push our journalism chops farther and farther into the future. Um, but also you get advanced access to these interviews. So when we record a new interview, we'll release it to the patrons a couple of days early and then everybody else gets to see it. We've also added a patron only podcast to our feed. And this is more of a behind the scenes thing, one that explains the philosophy of viewers today, what are the challenges that we're facing right now? What are the big projects we're working on? What are we hoping for the future? I also answer a whole bunch of questions from the patrons just about the day to day operations of the company, how we tackle certain problems. I'm not sure whether all of the future ones will be in that same one or will cover different topics. But it's a fairly long conversation with with me and my producer Anton. And I think if you're interested in how Universe Today itself functions as a company, you might enjoy that behind the scenes look. So get access to the interviews early here, the patron only podcast, get a shout out. And in all of the episodes that we do, you get ad free access to the Universe Today website for life, join our Patreon club, go to patreon.com slash universe today. Terran one is dead. Long live Terran R. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the partial failure of the Terran one rocket, which is this 3d printed rocket system created by relativity space. And based on the results of that test, relativity space has decided that they're going to go all in on the Terran R, which is the follow on rocket to the Terran one. A couple of new announcements they made, they're going to dial back the amount of 3D printing. Like originally their goal was 90% of the whole rocket will be 3D printed. They're going to be dialing that back and then bringing in more tried and true metal folding techniques to try and build the entire rocket system. I guess whatever works best to bring the cost down to make it as simple as and durable as possible they're going to find the right balance. So when you look at the Terran R, like originally it looked like a mini starship, but now it's starting to look a little bit more like a Falcon 9. And it really looks like that is the market that they're going to be trying to compete in. When the Terran R comes online in 2026, it'll be capable of sending 23,500 kilograms to low Earth orbit in a reusable booster mode. So just like Falcon 9, the booster will return for additional launches, but the upper stage will be discarded. And then they're going to have a heavier launch capability for one that is a fully expendable version of the rocket. So I think you know, the lesson here is that fully reusable two stage rockets are really difficult to create. And when you see them coming out of the gate and going after Falcon 9 as their competition, as opposed to where SpaceX is planning to go with a fully reusable two stage rocket with Starship. It's a tricky business, really hard to get right. But we wish them all the luck. More competition is better. A rocket powered space plane gets tested. The dream of a single stage to orbit rocket plane has been around for decades. When you go back and look at the original designs of the space shuttle, like they were trying to figure out a way to build a space plane that was fully reusable that could go to orbit. And eventually the final version wasn't that. We've all been following the developments of the Skylon rocket plane, which right now it's mostly just about building an engine, but hopefully one day we'll see this thing be able to go to orbit. It's hard and, and it's hard because of the rocket equation that the laws of physics just 
barely permit you to get a single stage to orbit in its current configuration with the kinds of chemical rockets that we have available to us. And that's why everybody builds multi stage rockets. It's much more convenient if you're going to throw away parts of your rocket to be able to get to space. But who wants to throw away parts of the rocket? That's very inefficient. So a new company called Dawn Aerospace is working on a single stage to orbit rocket plane, and they just tested out a prototype. Now this test, I mean, it went about 2000 meters altitude, it flew at a speed of about 300 kilometers per hour, but it did it with a rocket engine, which is pretty cool, and it was able to land safely. They're planning on building a Mark II version that will be able to carry payloads to 100 kilometers of altitude, but it'll be a suborbital trajectory. So it'll be able to drop a payload somewhere else on Earth. And their Mark III plans are to actually take a payload into orbit. Now they have sort of two options that they're looking at. One is to be able to take a 250 kilogram payload to orbit single stage and then return to pick up another payload. Then their other idea is to be able to carry about a 1000 kilogram payload to orbit using a disposable second stage. So if they can pull off that single stage to orbit with a 250 kilogram payload, that's really exciting. I mean, that is reusability at scale. So, you know, I wish them all the luck to solve this problem that has snared engineers for decades. And just to give you an example, we saw what happened with Virgin Orbit, right? You've got an airplane, it's launching a rocket that's going to orbit. Large parts of it are fully reusable and the company just filed for bankruptcy. So it's tricky business. Finally, a map of the moon in Lego. All right, check out this really cool Lego set. It's a map of the moon. It's about a meter tall and you could put this on your wall. And if you look really closely, it's got like the geological shapes on the moon, but it's also got the topology. You can see the taller mountainous highlands and then you can see the lower mare, the seas on the moon. And there's lots of prominent craters are featured on it as well. It's made up of 2360 pieces. And it's not a Lego set yet. This is one of those sets that's available for vote on Lego's community channel. So you can go there, vote and then at the time that we're doing this, there were about 8000 votes, they need to get to about 10,000 votes for Lego to take this seriously and consider whether or not they're going to want to turn this into a set. So if you want a giant map of the moon on your wall made of Lego, uh, definitely go and vote. We'll have a link in the show notes down below. All right, those are all the stories that we had today. Now, if you want a deeper dive into any of these topics, we've got links in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Jay Dennis, David Giltonen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verabeoff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news that we had today. We'll see you next week.